My name is Rob Garrigs. I took over for Tom Adams' uh, place here and uh, since September, and I've been, uh, you know, giving her ever since. Uh, as you can see, or will see, I've got lots of boats in here. Four in the shop and one in the garage, and uh, hopefully we'll get them all done by the spring and move forward. Things have been, been really well for us. And it's a 27 foot and uh, it, it has a special name uh, according to him. It's called Griffin. And he was the uh, head coach of the uh, uh, Griffin football team at the University of Guelph. So hence they uh, named the boat uh, Griffin. This one is in for a couple of things. Of course, uh, in, in natural use, it gets a couple of dings up the front and scratches and so forth. Um, it's in for that, as well as we had a problem uh, we noticed with every single plug. Uh, they call them bones sometimes, but the plugs on the boat, every one of them, was uh, somehow hollowed in. They were caved in. And that was uh, curious because, you know, like you don't often see that. You see them swelled out, so you rarely see them uh, concaved in. I suggested that we, we strip down the boat, uh, investigate, and uh, refair the boat again, try to flatten them back out and, and build it up, of course, with more stain and varnish. And in my investigation, I probably replaced about 200 uh, plugs. And, and during that time, I found numerous uh, plugs that were paper thin. Some were an average thickness. Um, but what I did find was they had a, a glue in behind uh, the plug. And technically, um, plugs aren't supposed to have glue uh, at the bottom of them. It creates a, an airlock. And Generally, you're supposed to just glue the sides of the plug and put it in, nothing on the bottom. But these were all, all had glue on the bottoms. Now, the theories as to why they, they concaved in, um, it, it's, everybody has their own theory. There, there's lots of them out there. I personally uh, think that it had something to do with the glue on the bottom as it dried it created a space, uh, like the glue absorbed into the wood and created a space there uh, with, a, with you know, the bar barometric pressure and perhaps humidity um, affected the air that was behind the plug and somehow, I don't know, chemistry-wise, sucked it in. Um, that's really all I can, I can see why hap what, what could have happened with them. But regardless, we fixed it, uh, I changed what I needed to change, I investigated every single plug and uh, we're ready to uh, put some stain on next week, it's going in the varnish room, and start building up coats. It also had, uh, the prop had a, a few dings in it, we got the prop uh, fixed. One of the, the windshield uh, pieces of glass were broken, we got that fixed as well. And, so generally the deck, uh, we didn't do anything with that. That's, that's not in the contract. We were just uh, contracted to do the side. So that's where that one stands. And it's nice to, to get into uh, a Butson like this. I, I mean, I like Butson boats. It's a Batten boat, but it's a new one. Um, I don't know if I just mentioned, but it uh, uh, was made in 2015 uh, to 2017 from what I understand. So it's, it's actually really new. Again, raises the question as to why the plug sunk in. You know, that's that's a whole other another ball game. I know why they come out, but whatever. And we're going to do the water line, of course. As you can see, we had to spray down into the water line, so that gets a fresh coat there as well. So that's uh, that's about it for for this boat. Okay, uh, this next boat we have here is uh, your typical sun flash. Everybody can probably recognize that. Um, it's a 1964. Uh, the gentleman who owns it uh, has owned it for, for many, many years, most of his life. And him and his father, um, you know, from time to time would, would tend to work on it, tend, you know, tend to it, fix it a little bit here and there. 
and it's got to the point where it's, uh, it needs some, some serious uh, uh, tender love and care. So we're going to, going to put a, as far as I'm aware, a half a bottom on so far, but it may turn into a full bottom. Uh, I know half of it's got some rot in it. There's that. We're going to uh, rake out all the seams um, because they're all cracked and lifting and splitting. And we're going to uh, recompound them and, uh, you know, obviously new seams means new, new stain, new varnish buildup everywhere. And if you can notice the side panels on both sides, so they have been replaced at some point in time. And we're going to try to bring them back to the original color or the color of the rest of the boat. And if that can't be done, which it probably can't, we're fully prepared to replace the uh, pieces of plywood and uh, again uh, match the color and, and varnish it all up again. And it's going to get some transom work and basically cleaning interior. That's, uh, that's about it for this boat. And that, hopefully that should be done by this, right? The next boat we have in is uh, what they call a, a link. It, it's a link boat. It's a 14 foot cedar strip built by uh, the link company back in post World War II. Apparently a munitions uh, factory uh, converted into making boats back then. From what I understand, uh, Mr. Link himself was quite the philanthropist and he got into inventing a lot of the scuba gear um, that we use today, uh, some devices and things. He even worked for NASA and, and developed bits and pieces of uh, the astronauts uniform or outfits and, and so forth. And he got into boats, a little bit into planes and things like that. So. He was quite the, quite the character. Anyways, the, the boat's uh, built fantastic. And it's, it's owned by a gentleman now who bought it about uh, 14 or 15 years ago. Saw it um, at, at, at the boat show. And his wife, uh, who absolutely fell in love with it at the time. So he, he bought it for his wife. And it had an outboard motor, an 18 horse uh, Evinrude on it at the time and his wife uh, didn't quite like to use the outboard motor. So he got rid of that and put an electric on for her. She absolutely loved it. She goes out almost every day early in the morning and, and goes around their property and looks at uh, their flowers and gardens and things like that and, and just absolutely loves the boat. So we're putting a little special uh, attention to it, making sure it's done, done right for her. When it came in, uh, we only quoted for certain little things here and there, but as with wooden boats, we found uh, quite a bit more damage than we anticipated, especially up into the stem area. It, uh, it started back here, then we found rot, 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 and just kept going. Finally, we're at the end of the rot there, so we've been working on the stem uh, and putting all the new ribs into it. And it's going to get obviously a whole new bottom. And then uh, his wife's name is uh, Vivian. And we're going to be putting that on the, the front of the boat for her. It's going to get a complete sand, complete refreshing uh, varnish, new paint, and new transom. And she's going to look beautiful when she's done. This one is uh, in our garage right now, a little cold, but. We're, we won't be getting uh, to this one until uh, it warms up a little bit and we have a space out there. However, this one's called Monte Cristo and it's a 1926 Johnson, which as we know are slightly bigger than uh, the, the dippies that were around uh, during that period of time. This one is a, a very special, like I say, 1926 and a few more years and it'll be 100 years old. This one was owned by, the gentleman's name was uh, John B. Aird, uh, who was the uh, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. 
and uh, he had this for numerous, numerous years. It it went through uh, four other hands until the current owner got it. He was always uh, friends with the uh, the Aird family, and uh, anyway, he he eventually ended up with it, which he's very happy about. The motor right now, it's at Matt Fairbrass's place, uh, getting rebuilt, redone. What we are doing to this is um, actually uh, quite simple. It's, it's leaking tremendously. So we are going to uh, do something with the seams. We're going to repack the seams and re-clinch the clamp nails there. Hopefully tightening it up so it won't leak. Fresh coat of varnish, it should be as good as new. So that's, uh, that's pretty much with this one. Uh, th this gentleman's been keeping a huge record. Look at the size of that binder, full of information about this boat. Way too much that I can, I can remember right now, but yeah, so that's what's happening with this one. Hey, welcome to uh, James Oser's uh, boat shop just outside of Port Carling. This is a Chris Craft Sportsman. I think it's probably um, mid to late 50s, and it's in here for a full uh, restoration. The owners spent countless uh, time with other shops in, in the U.S. and finally were unhappy with what was happening and the boat became unreliable so they brought it up here to get it dealt with correctly. So as you can see all the main frames are in the boat now and we're starting to fair out the framework to get a good smooth uh, planing surface for all the uh, This is, this is the oak chine, which we're going to rabbit the planks into instead of how it was originally where it was just the planks overlapping. Because this is on Lake Erie, it's going to get big water, so we need to make it stronger than what Chris Craft had originally done. Uh, it's got a, uh, the original Chris Craft six-cylinder K engine is in it. And it's been rebuilt and it's pretty, re it's somewhat reliable. It needs a couple uh, accessories work done to it. So that's going to go off to Whiteside Mechanical to get that completed over this winter. Okay, so yeah, the, ma the major work is, is the new bottom. And then once that's completed, then we'll refinish the hull sides and decks. All right, so this is a Seabird from 1949. Its home is on the Severn River, and it came, I got introduced to this boat over the summer at Whiteside when it came in to get mechanical repairs done because the marinas in his area finally just couldn't do any more to it. So Matt got it up and running. The owner really enjoyed it over the summer and then he approached me to get the boat looking as good as the motor was performing. So that dictated he needed a new trans, new half transom and a full refinish on it. And we found a couple other little minor issues during the process that we fixed, such as refastening of the bottom that needed to have been done. And now we're on to staining at this stage. So right, right now, stain-wise, we've just uh, put the water stain on, which gives us an even tone of color. The new wood, you can see, is a lot brighter. We have to water stain that one more time to tone it down because the new mahogany is far lighter than the old mahogany. So by end of today, we'll have oil stain on. And then we'll start varnishing 14 coats. From the oil stain after today will still take about another month and a half of work to apply the varnish, the deck seams, polish all the chrome, 
and put the boat back together. All right, this is a 1934 Port Carling Boat Works, otherwise known as Seabird. It's 17 feet long, uh, which makes, what makes this a unique model from Seabird is, from what I've been told from a couple people, is they only made four of this model. And it's a two cockpit interior with a hatch over the motor, but two jump seats on either side of the engine. And that's what makes it unique. And the other thing that makes this one unique is this is possibly my old family's boat that was purchased new in 34. It, it took me and dad just over, a little over 10 years in searching for it from rumblings that it was still around. We're not 100% sure if this is the one. We have a bit more research to do to verify that fact, but it, it's here for full restoration because it really needs it. So, so far we've put all new ribs in it, eastern white cedar on the bottom, back into mahogany, and we'll be starting to redo a Possibly the whole deck because the decks are pretty banged up with a lot of the nails showing Chunks of the deck are missing and a lot of the iron screws and iron nails have now bled black into the wood Which won't be able to get won't be cleaned up enough to make it look good so new deck is possible, but yeah this would have been if this is it, but regardless, it's the same model. This, it, my grandfather, great grandfather, would have purchased it new in '34, and then my, I believe it's my grandmother, learned to drive a boat on this model. So we've we've got a family connection to it. So it'll be nice to bring the model or the boat back home. All right, so this is our little storage waiting for these are these boats are waiting to come into the shop to get work done. So we got a Seabird here, which is going to get a major repair done. It needs keel and trines and bottom planks and a transom rebuild and a full refinish. Then we got a 23 foot ditch burn that also is a major repair of a couple bottom planks some framework and a transom and fresh coat of varnish over the whole thing and then way in the back under the white Mastercraft cover is a Duke Playmate that also needs major repair work with planks and a keel. Um, my name is Matt Fairbrass. Uh, I live in Muskoka and uh, Welcome to my shop. Uh, I'm the owner of Whiteside Mechanical. I'm a, a Class A licensed truck and motor coach uh, mechanic and I've uh, been working on engines pretty much my entire life. Um, just uh, have a lot of engines in. It's uh, the winter 2021 and um, the COVID hasn't slowed yeah. anything slowed anything down with me. Uh, I've got a good number of them in, and uh, just kind of rushing forward to uh, get them done for the spring. This particular engine actually uh, belongs to James Osler, who's uh, you've probably visited uh, on the film. Uh, this is a boat uh, that he's building for himself. Um, this is actually a, kind of a rare engine. It's a Buchanan Rocket. Um, it was in really, really tough shape. It's a uh, it's an unusual model from uh, Hercules back in the day. It actually was a, a combine engine that was used uh, in agriculture. But there was many surplus engines available um, back in the 40s and the 50s. And uh, I guess Buchanan was able to uh, obtain many of them or several, a few, few dozen or so. And it's been converted to marine use. Um, James found this engine behind a barn uh, kind of down a hill. and. <laughs> It was, uh, it's tough. It was, uh, it was really in rough condition. Most of the engines we're finding now uh, are in relatively poor condition. Um, they've had a lot of uh, sitting. 
So it's been completely uh, rebuilt. Uh, there was a donor engine that came off an island uh, on Lake Muskoka that James knew about. So cylinder head, manifold, internal components, uh, some of which have been reused. Um, it has original pistons uh, fitted um, because I like running the original uh, Zollners that are in there. Uh, so it was sleeved back to original uh, dimensions in the block. Um, all the ancillaries have been gone through. Uh, oil filters, pumps, distributor, uh, ignition system. There's really nothing that hasn't been touched on it, including the transmission uh, seals. It's the only way to do them if you're going to put them in a boat and nobody wants an oil leak or unreliability. Um, everything in here, this engine, by the way, is uh, 1948 or 9, maybe as early, late as 51, I'm not certain. But it, it's, it's pushing on. Um, Anyway, uh, a great build. It's been converted to 12 volts. Uh, the starter and generator are both done. Um, trying to think what else that uh, I may have missed. Um, pretty much ready to start it up. Uh, just a few little details and uh, then it'll be painted. Uh, it's a powder blue. Um, it's a funny color for an engine, but uh, Buchanan did that. And I was able to find a couple of good plates and uh, underneath, I know it was the original paint because underneath the Buchanan nameplate was this co exact color. So we were able to get it matched. So back to powder blue it, it is. And um, I hope it runs as well as I'm pretty sure it's going to run. So it certainly pushed the boat at a good clip. Um, so there we have it. Something that's really overlooked uh, with the marine engines, it's, it's incredible how many times that, I, and I call these engine mounts really an ancillary, but they're part of it, the carburation, starters, generators, fuel pumps. That's all the stuff that runs the engine. Well, these actually hold the engine up, and it's really, really important. This is an original. Um, usually, this is actually a good original, decent. Normally, the rubber separates, the metal breaks off, or they sag. Well, when that happens, the problem is that your shaft alignment goes out. When your shaft alignment out, is out, all bets are off. You have vibration, potential hull damage, bearing damage in the transmission, um, just a very unpleasant driving experience, sometimes oscillations through different RPM ranges. And people think it's a propeller, it's the engine's got a problem. That, that could be, but amazing number of times it's an alignment problem. As these start to sag and depress, they don't come back. And it's a slow, even, constant pressure. These engines are 300 to 500, 700 pounds. The motor mounts um, were not the best design, but in the day, it's what they had, it's what they used. I've been able to source them in the States. I've modified these slightly with a back strap for strength, but however, these are a beefier mount they are still used uh, and thankfully still manufactured. So here's one here on the engine fitted. I, there will be a very, very minimal deflection. It'll hold it where I want to uh, at any kind of speed and planing because uh, it's these that take the torque of the engine. If they weren't there, the engine would basically flip out and roll over. <laughs> so um, pretty simple thing, but it's something that's m not all builders, but many a time they're either just replaced with an angle iron or a chunk of wood or a block. These do cushion the vibration. The engines run so much smoother, they sound better. Um, simple thing, however, I pay 90 bucks a US for them, about $100. By the time they're here, taxes, duty, exchange. People don't realize that there's a lot involved with couriers, um, order time, all of that stuff. You're about $250 each. Well, do you want to spend $250 each on a mount times four? Yeah, if you're rebuilding an engine that's potentially fifteen or twenty thousand dollars, or you're in a shaft which is fifteen hundred to eighteen hundred some dollars, uh, don't uh, don't forget the mount. I'm Tim Butson. This is my new shop in Gravenhurst which eventually be my retirement shop. Um, we kind of tease everybody because I have waterfront down here with three pet beavers, um, but it's just a real neat shop to be in. Um, this is my a 21 foot Duke 1965. 
and my dad actually built it, which is one of the last boats he built. He redesigned the previous 21 foot Duke that they had into a hard chine boat so they could put V8s in it. There's, we think, five of these built. We're not sure. He can't remember. Um, so it, it came in for some hull damage, which turned it to be a lot of damage. And we had to put most of the bottom in it. Uh, that then led to strip and refinish and getting a new upholstery. And Jeff did the engine for us. So all that's new. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with that one. Okay, uh, this is a 49 century. Um, don't think there's too many of them around. Has a little four cylinder gray, I think, in it. Um, it was a boat started as a family restoration, kind of got beyond them, um, and his sons had offered to repair the boat, um, but they didn't quite realize that the amount of funds that was required. So dad kind of picked up the, the whatever, and here it is being done. Um, basically come down to that needed a brand new bottom as we're doing. Then we'll get back to the refinishing um, and put nothing all back together. Everything came to us in boxes and bags and stuff. So uh, it's a project and it should be done hopefully late this summer. Um, um, we've changed all the frames. They were all mahogany to start with. And I beefed them up a little bit, but we've changed all those. Um, we had to take some side planking off because in the production of the boat, Sentry kind of got very close to the edge of the battens and it's surprising that some of the planking stayed fastened. Um, for some reason, their early boats, and I may have tended from some of their outboards that the planking is only about 3 eighths, which is pretty thin. So they never plugged them. They used smaller screws and smaller holes and then they just had a a filler that was good enough that it would take the stain and, and hide away. So we'll have to do that as well. Um, the stringers in turn were still good, which quite often they are. And the transom scud is being replaced. And all the sentries are batting the same bottom, so that's why everything's notched. And we'll put it all back that way. Um, this is a 1949 Streamliner. Um, we restored this approximately 20 years ago. It lives on Georgian Bay and it's back basically for refinishing. It just suffers a little bit more over there because of how it's stored summer and winter. But um, so it's back here for make it look pretty again. Um, basically in pretty good shape. At the time it was completely restored and repowered with a V8 which makes it run really nice, so just a nice boat. So it has a 5.7 V8 fuel injected, so it just starts really easy and it really appeals to this older guy. Um, and it just runs nice with it, so good engine. This is a 2008 19 foot gentleman racer designed by my dad. Um, this is our version of the Manette Shield racers. Um, this is the last one of the size that Dad built, and then we went on to bigger, better ones. Uh, it has the same 5.7 V8 mercury in them. They do about 50 mile an hour. Um, all the hardware is designed and made by us, via castings or flat brass. Um, this one's in for basically some refinishing. A fellow one. Like Simcoe owns it, um, so it's well cared for because of water conditions down there. Um, so it's here for that, and then it should go home this spring. Um, he's to the age where you may consider selling it, just because it's getting more difficult to get in it. So that's uh, the story on this one. The net racers, which we've restored pretty much every one that he built, um, they were built with inline sixes and some fours, I think. But then, as soon as we hit the 60s, you could start getting V8s, and they started putting V8s in them. 
and the boat was just physically too small a bottom, so somebody came up with the idea of putting sponsons on the side and full width trim plates on the back to give the boat some running surface, and they ran a lot better. They were a little hard to get up on the plane, but they ran better. Um, and having done that, when Dad decided to, to build one of these, um, we kind of incorporated that into this boat, so adding some length to it and some width to it. So when we did put the V8 in, then they ran properly with, with that power. So it's a 1938 Chris Craft. Uh, the gentleman from Toronto has cottage on the Muskoka Lakes forever. Um, he bought the boat in the States and brought it up to us. Um, we did some repair work at the time and totally refinished it in chrome and upholstery. And I think it had been repowered already. Um, so basically, this is that condition from early 80s, I guess, when we did the boat. Um, so when it came to us this fall, it was just leaking too much. And so it ended up putting a full new bottom on it. And we're a traditional shop, so we put the double plank bottom as on as Chris Craft had done it. So there's uh, once all the framework was changed, and keel and stem and transom frame. Then we put a quarter inch mahogany inner skin, the canvas, and then the half inch planking on the outside. Then it's all riveted together. In this case, because of the way it's built, um, we basically had to uh, use little bolts instead of the rivets just because we uh, can't access it all inside. Um, and we added some extra frames back because it's got a V8 in it now. Um, so we just stiffened the bottom up a bit more, which is what he asked for. So once we get the missing plank back on, then we can roll it over and all the stuff that's accumulated in the corner has to go back in it and then they'll have it for the summer again. So.